Hey. It's Friday, bitches. So let's go. I was thinking... I was having a thought... That today... I want to do something fun. What do you guys think about that? I disagree. Thomas Williams says finally, I'm not sure what that means. But okay. A bit rude. Um, yeah, so I was talking to some, uh, some students. And you know, the stuff that... Um, um, that uh, Sahil showed. Uh, on his uh, whoops, Crowley. So he was talking about uh, in his um, mentoring uh, the other day about doing some sort of system with uh, U objects and how to override those and what the rules are there. So I thought we'd go through that because uh, it is quite important to know. Because uh, sometimes at some point you're gonna have you're gonna want to make a system. That sort of interacts with blueprints and interacts with the editor. That is not necessarily actors or components. Um, so that becomes uh, useful for yeah a lot of things. So I thought we'd do that today. And the way we do that, we do that. The way we're gonna do that is that we're gonna make a power up system. It's kind of like Mario, part card game, where you like pick up something, like you're running around, and then you pick up a pickup. And then you get some weapon or or boost or something. I thought that'd be fun. So we're gonna make that today. Sounds awesome. Yeah, baby. Um. So let's fucking go. So. First order of business, let's make a pickup. So I will have define some terms here. We'll have a pickup, which will be like a cube or something in the world that you sort of run over with your car to pick it up. And then each pickup will give you a power up. And a power up will be the actual like ability or whatever that you can use on your car to do something. Uh, so pick up will be the actual thingy, like the actor in the world that you overlap to pick up the pick up the power up, and then the power up will be the thing on the car that sort of does the thing. How neat! So pick up and power up. That's going to be our two terms today. So let's start by making the pick up. Just so we have that. So I will head over into our source code, and I'm going to add a new folder called power up. And here I will make some files. I will make power up pickup dot h. That's kind of a weird sound. Power up pickup. Pick up 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 pip up pip up power up pickup. That's CPP. Alright, there's supposed to be prefixes race. Never mind. Okay, so race. Power up, pick up. There we go. Because we picked uh, race to be our prefix here. <coughs> Usually, this prefix would be like something like haze at haze light. So we would like haze power up, pick up, or embark had it used embark. So usually it's like something like that. Uh, but since we don't have a company right now, uh, we're only at school. I'm just gonna prefix them with something. So race. That is the standard. So now that I've added those files, I'm going to regenerate progress files. <laughs> yeah, we're going to make a company. What do we call it? Any good names? Crash and burn. Is that too obvious? Misfits. Um, 
So now that I've regenerated the thing, we should have a power up filter here with our power up pick up. Babadoo. So let's make this. So I'll go head over into race power up pick up dot h. I'm gonna prank on what I want. We're gonna include game framework actor. And include race power up pick up generated generated with H. Gonna make it a race power up pick up generated body. All right, there we go. Okay, there we go. Standard. Boring. Just the use. And in the CPP file, gonna open that shit up. So in the constructor, uh, we obviously want to have some sort of overlap sphere, so that we can. Um, uh, So that we can um, uh, so that we can overlap with the player. So I'm gonna make a U property. U property visible anywhere. I will make that a gosh darn uh, U sphere component. You know what? We're gonna make a root component for a scene as a root component, because why not? That's a very common thing to do. Speaking Cause... of uh, spheres, sorry. Um, is it is there like any component that's just like a two D sphere, so you can just like mark a like sphere straight on the ground and not have like a three D sphere sticking up? Not that I know. Okay. Not that I know. There is no. There is not very good 2D support in Unreal, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, that's that's what uh, I've heard. Okay. Yeah. But yes, that that would have been cool. Um. So I'm gonna make a scene component as the root. This is a very common thing to do because then you can actually move around all other components on the actor while keeping the root fixed. So, for example, now maybe we want the root of the pickup to be on the ground. But then I want to move the sphere component up a little bit. So the sphere component isn't just kind of stuck to the ground. Uh, so it's a very common thing to actually put a scene component as the root uh, for actors. Flatten a sphere. I don't think you can even do that. It's just changing the scale on one axis. I don't think you can do that. What do you mean you can't do that? You can't do that. It will still work as a sphere. Well, it will work, yeah. It was the, it was, you was just shrink it's gonna be close enough. <laughs> Your joke didn't work, Ruta. It that was not a joke. It didn't technically work, Ruta. Jeez. Okay, so we're gonna do root is equal to create default sub object. Gonna call it root. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna set the root component to be root. And we're gonna create the sphere. We've all done this a billion times at this point. We're experts. We know exactly what we're doing. Add a sphere component. And then set up the attachment to the root.
Well, I mean, we can try it, but I know in the code at least for a sphere component, in the end, when it does collision, it's gonna be a sphere. <laughs> no matter how the thing is actually scaled. Um, yeah, looks good to me. I don't see any problems with this. Let's uh, try it. Well, uh, wasn't root and sphere meant to be pointers? You're absolutely right. Thank you. Good catch. I am actually not very good at this. If you change the collider the same way, or there are no settings for that. Uh, well, the sphere collider only has a radius. Which makes sense. Like, I mean, you want to keep the sphere as a sphere. Use the point and a radius uh, for calculations. So it would be quite a lot more expensive if, if it actually had to take in the actual transform of everything. Oh, I, <coughs> I need to forward declare. Right, because the use sphere component doesn't exist. Yes. Oh, you guys are so good. Oh, you guys already calling out what I need to do. That's great. Also, I saw Sahil do this. Like, he f liked to forward declare in the actual statement like this. Like I talked about. So that's why we don't listen to him. He's an imposter. He works at Epic. Uh, he's teaching you evil tactics. Uh, so, yeah, uh, don't listen to him. Uh, he will teach you the bad ways. No, th yeah, you can do this. It doesn't matter. I like to do this, but it's uh, there's no difference. This is how Unreal usually does it. So if you go into some Unreal code, you're probably going to see this a lot. So that's how Unreal likes to do it. But I mean, I mean, come on. Let's get real here. So we're going to include components, sphere components, and we should be done. And include in CPP, yes. Thank you. How about sync components? No, we actually don't need to include that one. Then that one's already included. Duckly. That's such a such a platinum star. Yeah, you can uh, you can um, you can um, hand that in to Krister uh, and get uh, five hundred Chuck E. Cheese tokens. So that's good. All right. So, so now. We should have our power up pickup. There it is. Boom. How neat. Okay, can we go back just one second? Absolutely. You could make a really thin cylinder, probably. That's how Mario worked. There is actually no cylinder collider, so no, you can't do that. There is only capsule, and uh, yeah, that you can't do that one. So sorry. That, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> what can you do? Yeah, not much actually. Um, all right. Uh, so could uh, you go back to the code uh, just a uh, yes. little bit more? Absolutely. Just a couple of things. I mean, in the end, if you're making a 2D game, just make it thanks. Secret. I think I was like rather thinking, um, <clears throat> like if I want some kind of collision or trigger uh, when the player like hits uh, a certain type of uh, like space on the ground or something, uh, maybe I don't want it to trigger like when the player is midair, but only like if the player is actually like I don't know standing on that specific terrain, sort of. Mm. I would probably either make it really thin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or have some sort of like trigger when grounded. Yeah. Uh, trigger points. Yeah, true, true, true. 
I have an error on my sphere. What's the error ring for you? What's the error message? What's it complaining about? Uh, it says that I need uh, a semicolon. It probably means you haven't forward clicked. Mm. Make sure your forward declaration looks the same as the main. Yeah. Oh, I have the forward declare. Share screen. Oh, you're missing a end. You're missing an end quotation uh, or an end curly or, or end. What do you call it? Parenthesis. Parenthesis. <laughs> yeah, you're missing one parenthesis. Oh, 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 okay. Nice. Boom. Easy. Man, I love it when you guys have such an easy error because I look so fucking smart. I'm just like fucking like, pre cog. You can fucking see your problems from a mile away. You're welcome. Yeah, no problem. All right. <clears throat> so we have our actor. Has a sphere, has a root. Very nice. Of course, we want to make a BP version of this. Because that's how we fucking roll. So I'm gonna make a new folder called Power Up. And here I will add a new blueprint. So right click, blueprint class. And I will override from Power Up Pickup. There it is. Call it BP Power Up Pickup. Yeah, nose runny. So let's make <coughs> let's make a cube. So we'll move this up so that the root of the act uh sorry, the root of the pickup is actually on the ground. Which is quite nice. Then I'll just move the sphere up a little bit. And then attached to the sphere, I'll attach a cube. Let's reset the position here. Let's get it down. So that's going to be our pickup visibility thingy. It's relatively cool. Something like that, perhaps. Turn off collision on the cube so we don't crash into the cube. Turn off. It's just visual, so it should not have collision. Cannot open source file. Where is power up pickup? <clears throat> Did you add U class and stuff? I missed U, U class. Yes. Oh, yeah. So let's make a material for this guy so we can make him glow. Because I want to make him glow. So let's just make a super simple material for this guy. So I'm going to right click next to the BP power up. <clears throat> going to right click and add a new material here. Boom. <clears throat> Now, the naming convention for material is highly contested, but I like to do mat underscore. So M A T underscore. And then we'll do power up, pick up. So here's our material. I know that um, we're not gonna we're not gonna spend too much time on materials and stuff. Um I know that uh, Sahil has talked a little bit about materials. Uh, I will say that the big difference between Unreal and Unity is that there's no such thing as a shader. Like you can't write a shader for Unreal. Uh, there is only materials and that's it. And then those gets... It's kind of the other way where in Unity 
you have shaders that get compiled into materials where in Unreal is the other way around. You have materials that get compiled into shaders. So that's uh, kind of interesting. So uh, that's why I prefer Unity when I want to do shaders. Um, cannot open source file, raise power a pickup generated with H. Well, I don't trust that's uh, IntelliSense error, so actually build and see if you get the error. But can't you input code in a little code box? You can, but in the end that code is just going to get inserted into the compiled shader. It's not like you're writing like a pixel shader or writing a fragment shader or something like that. It's just that custom code node just gets inserted into the final shader. It's kind of lame. Uh, I mean, <coughs> in the end, it's made for artists, right? This shader system is made for artists to be able to be uh, do very powerful things very easily. So it's not necessarily made for coders. Uh, so that's uh, why. <coughs> I can send the code on, or can yeah, can someone send the code on Discord? Actually, yeah to uh, Victor. Um, yeah, so that's why they've kind of simplified the uh, shader thingy so that you don't actually write shaders, you just write uh, materials. Um, that's kind of the way they've done it so that uh, artists can work with it much easier. All right, but we're gonna just make this glow. So I'm gonna make a color. So I'll just hold four and click and that gives me this color constant node here. So I'll you make it, uh, what's a good power up color? Orange. So make it orange. Just plop that into base color. So now we have an orange ball. Sorry, what did you right click and create? I just hold four on my keyboard and click left click. Oh shit! Oh. Okay, great, thanks. And if I hold, well, that's the vector parameter, right? It's not a parameter; it's a constant. Okay. So that means we could not change this, uh, change this through blueprint. It's constant. Uh, if we wanted to make a parameter, then we would have to go and do vector parameter. I think maybe you can convert it to a parameter. Yeah, you can do that as well. Convert to parameter here. In case you want to. But we're not going to be changing colors, so I'll make it a constant. You can also Wait, hold how one. How did you do that? Sorry? How did you do the the uh, color? Hold four on yeah. your keyboard and then left click. Oh. It's very nice. <coughs> I, sh I should mention similar things exist for Blueprint. If you hold B and click, you get a branch. And there's a bunch of those. If you hold F and click, you get a for each loop and so on. So there are these nice, neat little shortcuts for blueprints as well. If you hold one and click, you get a scalar. So there's a, a scalar constant if you need to use a number and so on. Yes, you can right click and promote to right click and promote to parameter here. Um, yeah, so we have our base color, and of course, I want this glow, so I'm just gonna pop this into emissive color here. So now we have a little little bit of a glow. It's a little bit boring for my taste, like it's not glowing quite enough. Uh, let's try Alt F4 and click. So what I want to do is that I'm gonna the double click on our constant here. I'm also gonna set the alpha to 1, because why not? Doesn't actually matter, but... Was uh, it four and left click on the base color to get the color to show up? Show up? No, you just double click. If you double click, then you get the color picker here. And... <clears throat> um, and yeah, I just want this to be a lot brighter. 
And the way you do that is by making the color bigger. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know here the values are just 1 and 0 0.4. So they're kind of capped at those values. But I could type anything in here. I could type 50. And you can see that I get a huge red glow here. So you could make a color go above 1 uh, in all values. And that means like the emissive will be stronger. You can also just ha have this V here. V is currently 1. And you can also just change this to like 15. So that will scale every color up by 15. So now we have a very nice uh, yellow glow. So that's neat. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to save that. It's going to be our power up, pick up, color, material thingy. <laughs> Super simple. So let's apply it then. So I'll uh, press the cube, and here on materials, I'm just going to select power up, pick up. There we go. You have to be a bit careful with these emissives. Uh, you can really tell when a programmer has made an emissive because it's like a hundred. Is like huge and that will make the exposure of the camera actually go completely insane so <laughs> be careful with your emissives all right i think even 15 was a little bit much let's just do five <laughs> okay let's have some self-control here uh so let's do five <laughs> the v value gets bounced back to one when i press ok really yeah uh as soon as i press ok uh, I see in the preview that the glow disappears, and uh, when I open Color Picker again, it's one. Like when you hit this OK button here? No, not now. So you kind of need to go above one on one of the RGB. If, if I do that, uh, the V sticks. OK, that's weird. Well, well. I've never seen that before. That's really weird. Well, at least they have a workaround. Did I do 15 again? I did. Yeah, if you do 200, then it's uh, quite insane. It's like, Bleh! it'll make the Do 5,000. No. Do no, it. No, this experimentation is over. Do it, it's pretty. Oh, five. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> so there we have our power up glow. So now if I drag this BP version into the world. Uh, there we go. Now we have a nice, a very nice pickup. How neat! Boohoo! They all get bounced back down to one as soon as I press OK. What? I gotta look into that. Yeah, that's later. weird. I guess yeah, skip emissives for now. <laughs> Unreal doesn't let you. Did you assign the material to the cube? Uh, yeah, I assigned it to the blueprint. And then when I drag the blueprint to the scene or whatever it's called, it's not glowing. But mm, now when I open the blueprint, it uh, it isn't assigned. So I will try to assign it again. OK, hmm. you might have to click apply here as well. OK. Maybe. Fat maybe on that one. What did we make this cube inherit from actor? No, we inherited from our uh, code version. So it's inheriting from this race power up pickup. Uh, let's make it move a little bit because this is so boring. Uh, this is the designer inside of me. I don't want to have just a cube that is floating. I just want to have it do something. So uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to add some uh, visual pizzazz to this. <laughs> so I'll just go into tick and I will just say 
on the cube I'm gonna add um, add world rotation so I'll make it spin god it's laggy as hell hell I split this and I want to yaw it so I'm just gonna do times float times float So I'll do delta seconds times, I don't know, not too fast, 25. So I'm just adding a world rotation to the cube. So I dragged out the cube from the component list here to get the reference. And then I just add world rotation on that. So not add actor world rotation. I'm only rotating just the cube. <coughs> So now it's rotating slightly, so that looks nice. Uh, how did you split the rotation? Right click, split struct pin. Is there a shortcut to split those or do you... I think, it it, I think it's spacebar, but it does seem to work for some reason. I, I know that before you could do it with spacebar, but I can't do it anymore. But there probably is a shortcut, or if there isn't one, you can assign one. <laughs> you might need to multiply by delta time there, Jesper. Uh, then I'm going to make it float up and down. So I'm just going to set... Uh, we can use a fact here that we've actually aligned our actor quite nicely, in that when the cube is centered on the sphere, it has zero, zero, zero location. <laughs> I can't add my cube to target. You might have uh, made a, you might have made an add actor world rotation. What you need to do is drag the cube out and then from the cube type add world rot rotation. Since the cube, when the position is 0, 0, 0, it's centered on the sphere. We can kind of use that to create a very nice sine curve. To make it just move up and down a little bit. Since we can just fluctuate the said position of the cube. And that will keep it hovering around the center of the sphere. So I'm just going to apply a sine curve to this, like, said, uh, to the said position of this... Uh, um, of this um, of this cube and the local position that is not the world position because of course the world position could be anything like if we have three of these pickups then the world position will be different but its relative position compared to its parents or its local position uh, will always be the same so that's important so I'm gonna apply a sine curve to the relative Location or the local location. So we're gonna do set local. Is that it? I don't know what local location and relative location set local. Oh, that's add local offset. Oh, whoops. Okay, so we want to set relative location. Let's just make this a little nice. You can double click a connection to make a redirection node. Like this. And they don't do anything. They just make it so you can make your blueprints look all nice. Look at this. Looks great. Uh, Freya would love this because it's blinds. Um, so I'm just going to add some redirection nodes here and make this code all neat. Wait, what was the button? You just double click on a connection. Okay. And then you create a redirection node. <clears throat> Alright, so we want to set the relative location, so I'm going to split this. And we want to assign the set here, so I'm just going to drag out and do uh, sign. The radiance degrees doesn't really matter, I'll do the radiance. Um, 
So we wanna do the sign of time. So the get total what is this return? Get oh no, that's not it. Here, get time seconds. Um so this will just return the total time in seconds since we started the game. So just pop that into a sine curve and then I'll multiply the sign here by well not in types not float times floats. I'll multiply the sign by uh how much do we want to move? 80? No, that's too much. 50. There we go. So I'm just applying a sign over time. Times 50. 50, 50. Super simple. Super easy. So now, whoops, what happened to them? Did I, 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 maybe I deleted them. Okay, let's add a new one. Uh oh, what happened here? <coughs> Type mismatch. Check the output. Output is nowhere to be found. Let's go to view. Whoops. View output. Expected BP power pickup C found reinst BP power pickup C52. Uh, okay, seems like the Blueprint compiler had a little bit of a seizure there, so let's just F5. Okay, I don't know. But yeah, so now we can see that the power up sort of bobs up and down a little bit, way too much. So I'm gonna change the value there. How do you feel about structuring like this, Emily? I hate it. <laughs> I don't wanna see lines intersecting nodes. <laughs> Uh, so let's do a little bit less bobbing. Let's do 15. You see, bobs up and down a little bit. This is not important, by the way. This is just me being me. I have to um, add movement to everything. Emily, is is there a way to uh, for the multiplication? It only says x. Like, is it? Uh, is there a way to like add a description for it? Because uh, if you look at it uh, after a certain amount amount of weeks, you don't remember like <laughs> what does it multiply what's happening here oh yeah we can uh, select all these notes hit c to get a comment note oh, okay. comment box cool and then we can do like apply sine curve to cube so then if i move the comment you can see that all the notes mo move with it which is quite nice so it's good practice to uh, always comment your code you know you can also change the color, so I'm going to make this pink. It's quite nice. <coughs> All right, what a nice blueprint. This is very common uh, for stuff that is only visual. Like, you know, this has no effect on what's actually like the actual gameplay logic of this uh, actor. Like, it doesn't matter if the cube is rotating or not. It's very nice to put this kind of thing in blueprints. Because inevitably, inevitably, the artists want to change it. Like, they want to be like, okay, your sine curve is dumb and it doesn't look good. Then at least they have some sort of access to go in and change it if they want to. And then we're keeping C++ to be gameplay logic only. While blueprint is sort of visual only. Uh, for this system, like it's okay to make gameplay in blueprints, there's nothing wrong with that, but for this system it's nice that we split those two, two things up. How did you change the color on the comment thing? Select the comment box, 
just hit the header there. And then here you have comment color on the right. Okay. Blueprints are inevitable, yes. As we're gonna see in a second, blueprints are inevitable. Right. <coughs> Brown prints. God. It's the worst thing I've heard. Um, yeah, so great. So now it's popping up and down. Looks really nice. How nice. It looks uh, almost like some other video game that I can't really place the name of, but... Um, cool. Like, nothing works for me. <laughs> nothing works for you? <laughs> no. Well, it's time for a break uh, anyways. So let's take... Uh, Let's take a 10 minute break and I can help you uh, Gregor out with your issues. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, no problem, sir. Uh, did you manually adjust the, the location Z? The yep. Cube? With this set relative location. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I think I got that part, but it doesn't. So I was thinking in the in like the transform component, did you change it uh, in like the details of the cube? No, it's just zero. That's just zero. Okay. Yeah, it's just zero. And when you just created the blueprint. Uh, I think you did some changes to the cube uh, settings. What was that? Uh, I missed that. Well, I moved everything up, but then I also just turned off. I turned off collision on the cube. Okay. Uh, you moved everything up. What do you mean? I moved the sphere up a little bit, but that shouldn't really change anything. Show your screen. I think that's going to be simpler. Whoa! <laughs> She's blue. Uh, yeah, you what? haven't you haven't plugged those in, the add world rotation and set relative location. You see, the exec pins aren't actually plugged into anything. Oh yeah. So you need to plug those <laughs> into tick. Again. Well, no, in a row. After a shot, yeah. Yeah. There you go. That might have been the issue. <laughs> Woo, there it's you go. It's moving. Oh, that reminds me, I have another thing. It's it's like the it thinks like the, this plane is is um like in an angle. Do you see how it wants to like here I can almost make it stand still, but if I turn like this it starts rolling. And if I turn the car around, it goes the same way. So it's almost, it's almost as if it's not level. <laughs> uh, I'm not pushing. I'm not pressing anything. That's weird. And, and as you can see, the input is zero. Seems to mean like you have some sort of problem in your mathematics. If you look at the movement yeah. code. Yeah. Movement code for your car. Let's see. So you do owner uh, exit forward vector times acceleration times drive forward input times delta time. Uh, you do grip velocity, blah, blah, blah. Velocity is that, yeah. So you do that. Well, it doesn't look wrong to me. And you, do we uh, have any movement here? We don't, right? No, we shouldn't have anything there. If you go into, uh, if you run a game and then put, um, so put a, yeah, so run a game. And then while it's running, put a breakpoint in the collision code. All right, let's first move out. Uh, yeah, let's do it a bit faster. <laughs> so put a, uh, like restart the game and then put a breakpoint before you start playing. So you can uh, see before you hit that little cube there. Oh, I guess I'll have to, because it, it 
that's just the thing that it starts moving on its own. Uh, I'll move cube. So you want to see if it's actually collisions that are messing up here. Uh, where did do you want it? In the hit, like if he hit blocking hit is true. Are you debugging? I don't know. I uh, minimized oh, yeah, the debugging. thing here. Uh, yeah, you are running. Um. Well, now it even doesn't even seem like it's run like it's not even tracing at all put a breakpoint somewhere in else in tick like in the beginning is this even running at all Uh, <laughs> uh. I, I just switch, switched back to to Rider a couple of days ago, so I don't even remember the debugging things here. Yeah, I don't know why it isn't breaking. Uh. I'm gonna try restarting, I guess. And make sure to. R oh yeah, a rider has like a run and a debug for some reason, so you have to click debug there. Oh yeah. Well, that's why I remember this. I remember I had a lot of problems with this in uh, FG20. Okay, so now this is running. There we go. All right, so let's see if we have hit then. So put, yeah, step. Oh. Step out of this. Step out? Yeah, step out of that. Okay, so s click the step over arrow instead. Definitely, yeah. Keep going. And down to the wild. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the problem with running in development. And that, uh, yeah, you can see it's jumping around a lot. That's because it's kind of a semi release mode. Yeah, but you just put a breakpoint in the hit, in the, in the, when you do the add actor world offset there. Yeah. Then uh, continue. Yeah, resume program. Yes. All right, let's see. Okay, so now I'll step over. Okay, so what's a uh, hit? Um, yeah, we didn't have a hit. What's velocity? If you hover over velocity somewhere in the code. It's a number. Why is it a number? <laughs> That's not good. Shouldn't it be? Did you press a button? No. No, so there shouldn't be a, True. Uh, there shouldn't be a velocity. That's and I also have a upwards Z velocity even. And they're all the same. Yeah, I think there's a plus somewhere. Uh uh that shouldn't be there. Uh Restart the game um, and break at the beginning of uh, this function. Like here? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 
I meant use restart in the editor, but that's fine. Okay, so let's run. So what is velocity now? Can I? Oh, you have to probably step. It hasn't. You have to step a little bit, there. I think. Just press step over a little bit. Okay, what is velocity now? Zero. Okay, so let's see when that changes then. So step over this function. What are the buttons, uh, I think? Okay, what's velocity now? Nothing. No. Step over. Step over. Step over. Step over. Is it getting somewhere or is it just... Uh, oh, yeah, it oh is. hold on. What's velocity now? It changed somewhere. It, what is roll velocity? Okay, that's not visible. I guess you can't uh, check any either roll velocity or grip. Oh, you have plus grip friction. But that's yeah. why. Uh, that should be grip velocity. There we go. That was the bug. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I assume there was a... Uh, there was a... Um, but should it be yeah, times it be grip. grip velocity? No, it should just be plus, plus grip velocity. Yeah, so that was why it was like all the values were being plused. Uh, because if you add a scalar to a vector, you just add all the components. So you were yeah. adding grip uh, grip, uh, grip friction uh, all the time, which is like three points something. So that makes sense. Oh uh, yeah, it's 3.8 and the uh... The values were like three points yeah, like seven, seven nine, 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 yeah. Alright, cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, that was a tricky bug. Tricky dicky. Uh, can I ask a question before we start? What did I say about asking to ask questions, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, but I, I know, but it was because it's like, it's 11.10 now, so starting, and it's a bit of an unrelated question. It's about angel script. What did I say about asking? Okay, answer my question. What did I say about asking questions to ask? I know, questions? I don't have to ask questions yes, to ask questions. Yes, that's what I said. Okay, what's your question? <laughs> uh, how different is the syntax in uh, AngelScript compared to like C++? Like, is it worth getting AngelScript or getting into it at least? It's very similar. Uh, that's one of the reasons that Lucas chose AngelScript because he likes that it's very similar to C++. It's kind of a halfway between C++ and C Sharp, um, which is quite nice. Um, so while it, there are a lot of analogies, like you write the code kind of like you are writing C++, the problem is in the details, right? You're missing a lot of de oh, excuse me. You're missing a lot of details from C++, uh, which is nice when you're writing, but it's kind of bad when you're trying to learn uh, C++. So that means if you learn a new script and then go to a company that doesn't use it, then there's a lot of details in the C++ that you don't know because you kind of skipped over that part. Um, but that being said, if you want to try using a script, I would recommend that. It's very fun. And it's just a great way to quickly play around with Unreal and have fun and not worry about Blueprint too much. Like, it's so much faster than C++ uh, coding-wise. Like, it's faster to code in the script. Uh, and it's insanely powerful. Uh, and, uh, 
So that's kind of why I mess up sometimes in C++. Like I, I forget things because I'm so used to English script now that is, there's so many details that I kind of like, oh, I haven't done this in so long that I kind of just forget about them. But uh, yes, they are. Otherwise, they are very similar. Yeah, because I was thinking like getting English script because I hate like have to change one variable and restart the entire solution. Oh, well, I mean, you're not going to get around that. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. For this course, I will force you to use C++. <laughs> but in your own time, feel free to use English script. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. In the end, it's like restarting the editor. It's just something you're gonna have to get used to. I'm sorry. Uh, you, um, it's very easy to get spoiled by scripting languages. How how like easy to code they are, and how fast it is to code and stuff like that. But in the end, uh, in many engines. You're gonna have to work with C++ as a coder. That's just kind of how it is. So you kind of have to get used to that. Um, Do you know what uh, companies use Angel Script? I think Sahil said that in Embark they use it as well. Yes. Do you know like if other big companies in Sweden use it? So they use it at obviously Hazelight. Uh, Embark was the first big studio to also use it. Um, also, I think. Fuck, what company did you and Brown go to? Do you guys remember? Fractal? Yeah, maybe it was them. Yeah, so they also use, uh, they also use okay. script. So like not many. Not many, no. Okay. Uh, hopefully that will change because Inscript is so fucking good, uh, but uh, it will take time. You should teach us, and then we can revolutionize the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's kind of what happened. That's that's why Embark changed because I went to uh, Future Games and t and taught them uh, and told them about Inuscript. So then, like I told them, and then they told Olaf, and then Olaf told Embark, and that's how Embark got on that train. So it's kind of like uh, that's kind of how it happened in the beginning. Revolution. All right, let's continue. So, uh, oh, whoa, whoa, oh, hey. Yeah, if you hit the F buttons, you can get all kinds of weird uh, editor views. You can do, uh, <laughs> with the, you can do, um, wireframe, you can do unlit, which is quite nice. This is F2, so I'm hitting F1 for wireframe, F2 for unlit. Uh, unlit is quite nice if you're in a level that's very laggy and you just wanna play the game without lag, then you can do an unlit mode, which is kinda nice. Uh, and then F3 go ba goes back to the regular uh, lit mode. Then F4 is some sort of like shader. Oh, F oh sorry, F4 is untextured. And then F5 is like a shader complexity thing, which I'm not quite sure what this does or means. But uh <laughs> guess it's some sort of yeah, I don't know what is some sort of debugging tool for artists. Let me scan it. Wait. F F one, two, three, four? The F one to F five, yeah. There are the different view modes. It doesn't seem to work for me. Really? You need to unselect Same whatever here. you have selected, I think. Yeah, I'm in the game, by the way. I'm, like, playing the game. Yeah, uh, in I the see. in the editor, uh, it doesn't work. Then you have I to go see. in here, to this lit button here, and then select, like, unlit and so on. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. Um... Yeah, you ship the game in Unlit, what's the problem? So, um, yeah, we obviously want it to be like, so when I overlap with this guy, it's going to disappear. So, I am going to go into code. And we're going to add a on component begin overlap. Yay, our favorite function. Uh, I'm actually going to steal it from somewhere else, because uh, I don't want to write it again. So I'm actually going to go into, wait, did we actually use it in this project? No, it was the other one. I think. It was the other project. 
Okay, we're writing it then. I think I know it from memory, so I think it's like handle handle overlap. So it's like U primitive component uh, overlapped component, then it's A actor, other actor, then it's U primitive component other component, then it's int32 body index bool b from sweep and const f hit result sweep hit I think that's it let's do a vertical slice this time So I'll go and define that. And then we'll bind it. So we'll do on component begin overlap. Add dynamic. This. A race power up pick up column column handle overlap. <coughs> If that's true, I am I am considering myself the fucking unreal god. If I got this first try. Praise me, for I am the unreal underlord. Oh, whoops. Oh, it's not a, mar a U function. Whoops. Okay, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. I forgot to make a U function. <sighs> Slipped on the exit there. Didn't stick the landing. Okay, so we have an overlap now. So let's just do when we overlap. I'm just going to destroy. And that's it. Whoops. So now hopefully, when I drag this bad boy out, and I play, and I go through him, he disappears. How nice. Wait, wait you, you wrote destroy in the handle overlap? Yes. So that's will be that will be replaced by the actual pickup code when we write that. I think that's actually one of the <coughs> one of the assignments when you apply for Epic Games. You have to write a handle overlap uh, callback in one try. And if you fail then they say like you're clearly not worthy. I love in this view, hold on, I need to show this. I love in this view that I'm so much bigger than Tove. It can be like... Tove, high five. What about now? Oh, shit, wait. Like this? No, this, yes. High five. Good. Whoopsh. High five. Whoopsh. Oh, look at that. Whoopsh. Small hands. No, wait, why did I zoom out? I don't know, this, I this is doing super weird things. Like sometimes you guys grow and sometimes you disappear. <laughs> I'm I'm picking the worst ones. <laughs> oh, gross! As long as you eat it afterwards. Environmentally friendly. All right, so. Um, cool. Uh, I think now is a great time to talk about actor channels, or sorry, object channels. Um, because it's a bit dangerous that we're just kind of destroying at any overlap. Because what if we have like a cube? 
where we uh, simulate physics. And I also have to check this generate overlap, but doesn't matter. Really. So you can see that even though the box, I'm actually going to simulate this so we can have a better view. So I'm going to hit simulate. We can see that the box actually destroyed the, <laughs> the pickup. Which is a little bit weird. And you know, if we have a trigger box or something and we want to place the pickup inside of the trigger box, then we'll start having a lot of issues. <clears throat> yeah, the box the box gets power up. Very scary. Um so we could do, you know, the check that we did before. So we could do something like, you know, if other actor is a uh, a uh, race car. Like that sort of thing. So we kind of check uh, what the other actor is. But I think we can do this the proper way. Uh, and that is to uh, make object channels. So remember, in our big ass matrix, our collision matrix, we have all of these checkboxes, right? For each object. We also have the trace responses. We're not going to talk about this just yet. We'll stick to the object responses here. Uh, they are different. And this is how the um, this collision box, like this sphere, should react to every other different type of object. And as you can see, all of them are marked as overlap. So it will overlap with just about anything in our world right now. So there's nothing it won't overlap with. But this is kind of scary. So let's make a custom object for ourselves that is like just a car. And let's set it so the, it only overlaps with that one object type. So it will ignore everything else except for the car. So then we know if we do trigger an overlap, then we know that the thing we overlap with is a car. So I'm going to do that. We could, of course, reuse like pawn or vehicle or something. But I actually just want to show you how to make your own object type just for like practice. Uh, so yes, of course, we could reuse these, but I want to show you how to do it. Uh, because it does come become important. I kind of want to remove the default ones, but it doesn't seem like I can. This is kind of sad. Um, I, there should be one way to do it, but ah, whatever. So what we do is that we hit this new object channel here. I'll name it uh, car. <laughs> I'll name it race car. Fuck it. <coughs> and then we have our default response. And this is how objects, other objects in the world, should by default interact with this race car. And I'm going to set block as a default. Uh, doesn't, I mean, it kind of depends on what you're doing. But I'm going to set block. So every other object in the world that hasn't like overridden their collision profile or the collision settings, their collision matrix, will by default block the race car. Which kind of makes sense because like the car should like crash into walls and stuff. So it makes sense that the default response should be block. So let's accept that. Accept that. Accept that. Accept that. So now our default will be block. I'm actually going to go into presets. God, there's so many here. Uh, let's delete a, b a few of these. <laughs> I'm actually going to delete everything that isn't like super important. I'm going to delete UI, I'm going to delete vehicle, ragdoll, trigger, invisible wall dynamic, invisible wall, structable, physics actor, character mesh, spectator, pawn, overlap only pawn. Ignore only pawn. There we go. So now we <laughs> so now we just have these five presets that we can use. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into all of these presets and just make sure that the race car behaves like it should, because the problem now, of course, is that if I look at this, if I look at this trigger or the sphere component here. We can see that actually we block the race car. So we have overlap all dynamic, which means it should only overlap. 
But in that preset, the race car got set to block. Because that was the default response. But that doesn't really make any sense because overlap all dynamic means overlap everything. So here the default the default preset for blocking doesn't actually work because it's not blocking. Or sorry, because now we should overlap. We shouldn't block. So that's why I want to head in over to. That's why I want to head over into collision here. Presets and then it's overlap all dynamic. I actually want to set race car to be overlap. So you just want to update this overlap all dynamic preset to also overlap the race car, the new object type we added. Block all dynamic, yeah, looks good. It should block everything. Overlap all, it should overlap everything. So you set the race car to overlap there. Block all, everything should be blocking, and it is. So accept that, and then we're done. Cool. <clears throat> so now we've added an object channel and we've set up all of the presets that already exist in the world to actually be to be consistent with how it worked before. Overlap all still overlaps everything, block all still blocks everything. So that's good. Yeah, how do I add the car to the preset? We don't need to add the car to the preset. We just need to add it to an object channel. We could make a preset if you wanted to, but oops, we're not going to. Since in the end, a preset is just like a, it's just a template way of setting up the matrix. Like this, these presets don't actually have any functionality on their own. They're just kind of a preset way of how to set up the collision channels. We could override these as much as we want. So they don't actually do that much. <coughs> Alright, so we have our race car. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the blueprint for the car. Whoops, I closed the viewport on accident. So let's just um, open that back up. <coughs> this window <coughs> a viewport in case you accidentally close one of these tabs um, and I'm gonna update the box collision here so I want this box to be a car object like the object type of this box will be a car so here in object type so I put, set a collision preset to custom, and then in object type, I'm going to select race car. So that means whenever this cube overlaps with something else, when it checks in the matrix here to see what's going to happen, it will see, okay, the other thing I overlap with, what is its response to the object type race car? And that's how two collision boxes will kind of determine whether it's a hit or an overlap or nothing. So now whenever this box collision collides with anything, it will check the other side's matrix for the race car entry and see what, what should be done. And of course check its own matrix for the other object to see if, if we want to collide with it. What was this entire process thing called? Like objects? Object channels. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, so that's what object channels are. They're a, a type. They're a type you set on the actual collision. So that every collision in the game has some sort of object type. So when two collision boxes collide with each other, uh, that's how you compare the two matrices to see if they should actually con uh, collide or not. So that's an object channel. That's how how we interact between those types the two uh, collision boxes. So now I can go into this this sphere collision here 
and I can uh, update its matrix. I'm going to put custom here for this matrix. So we're a custom matrix. Object type doesn't really matter uh, since in the end our car has been set to block with everything. So it doesn't really matter which type of object we set our sphere to. The world dynamic is fine. That essentially means it's something in the world. This is some sort of some act or it's just a general term for something that can be collided with. Dynamic means it can move. So static means it won't move. It will be static. And dynamic means it will move. So world dynamic seems like a good, good pick. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to ignore everything. So it won't overlap with essentially anything except for race car, which is going to overlap. Why did the boxes turn gray when you clicked on, like, ignore? What's that mean? Gray means, so if I if I click this, everything will become ignore. But I changed one, so these gray boxes, this line, that means, like, most are ignore, but some aren't. Uh, or <laughs> there are some ignores and there are some overlaps, but not everyone. That's what the gray boxes mean. While if everyone is ignore or everyone is overlap, then it's a checkbox. <clears throat> so now we can be certain, because that's the way we set it up, that if an overlap triggers from this sphere, then we know it's a race car. It can't be anything else, so we don't have to do that type checking. Also because it gets a little bit more performant, which is nice. You know, not bad. Not, uh, not a bad day's work. So now if I drive into this bad boy... Okay, so yeah, so first of all, the cube doesn't destroy the pickup anymore. You see? Even though the two clearly overlapped. Since this box is a physics body, apparently, is the object type. And our sphere does ignores physics bodies. That means these two won't trigger an overlap. But if I drive my car through it, then it triggers. Can you show us the overlap code again? Uh, you mean like here? <clears throat> right. So that's how to work with object channels. Um, at some point in your game project, you're most likely going to have to work with object channels to customize your uh, collision a little bit. Like using the default presets and the default object responses will only get you so far. Especially when you start talking about like stuff like projectiles and stuff like that. Uh, it becomes quite complicated. So that's when you need to add additional object, um, object types or object channels. Um, I think at Intex 2, we, I think we filled out, we have like 32 available positions and I think we filled out like 31 or something. We got almost to the end. So we had so many different, uh, object channels. Uh, uh, how do you make it so that the channels aren't grayed out when you interact with the objects? You have to hit custom here in the collision oh. presets. Okay, thanks. Would it be possible to create like more reactions than just ignore overlap block? No, not that I know of. So overlap and blocking is the ones, the only ones. Could be wrong though. As usual today, nothing's working for me, but never mind. 
look at it later. But I do have a question. <clears throat> when you click something uh, in, uh, if you like open the power up blueprint uh, and you like click cube there to the left, is there any way to get to like the resize, uh, move or rotate? Uh, to like focus instead of having to click on the the gizmo to change uh, the way to modify. Oh it. yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, absolutely. So you can, if you control click, so I'm just clicking anywhere. If I control yeah. click, then I move around the x-axis. Then I can okay. just click anywhere and move on the x-axis. If I right-click, I do the y-axis. Yeah, but now if you want to change to, uh, to like rotate. Yeah. Then it's E. Yeah. So if you instead click on the cube to the left. Yeah. And now you want to change to move. Oh yeah, you have to highlight the viewport. So you just have, kind of have to click the viewport once. Okay, okay, so it doesn't deselect it. Yeah. Then, okay. Yeah, you don't have to click on the actual thing. Like, you can okay. only, you can click just anywhere on the viewport and it will work. Okay. But yeah, that's very nice. So, left click X, right click Y, and then left and right click, you do Z. It's very common to do this when, like, you're something that's very far away or something that's small. <laughs> I know that uh, this becomes very nice. So you can kind of do that to quickly just reposition the cube without having to click the gizmos. It's quite nice. Also, the same thing works for rotate. So I can rotate around all the axes. And scale, of course. No, actually, no, scale doesn't work. <laughs> scale will only scale uniformly. Which uh, is the way it should be. <laughs> Only was it control you clicked? Yeah, control click. It's quite nice. So I do that quite often in the level. I just kind of do this instead of um, instead of actually dragging the gizmo. I tend to just do this. Bonk. All right, so uh, we can run into the pickup to sort of pick it up, kind of. Uh, but of course, we don't have any system right now for actually like getting a pickup and like it doing stuff. So let's do that now. The actual fun, the fun part of this lesson. Uh, first, I'm just gonna grab some water. Hold on. Okay, <clears throat> so how would we do power-ups then? Well, um, let's think about it. So the way I will probably do this is I will have some sort of base class, right? I will have some base, like, power-up. And then I would, you know, inherit from that to make a, you know, a boost power, excuse me, a boost power up.
and uh, you know uh, a gun power up or something like missile missile power up and so on <clears throat> and uh, this is a very common uh, design pattern like to do one abstract base class so this will be abstract so you can't which means that you can't instantiate it like you can't make you can't new a power up like you have to new one of the derivatives uh, and then to just inherit from that to make each power up in the game and we have to be a bit careful here because we're kind of, you know, we're stepping into like, you know, OOB, object oriented programming territory here with uh, inheritance and stuff. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful to not make it super complicated because uh, object oriented has a tendency to kind of run away from you and become super complex and kind of grow beyond what it should be. Um, so that's why usually when we do this we only allow or like you know allow in quotation marks uh, one layer inheritance meaning there's one base class and then there's one child so there's nothing like a boost power up and then we inherit from that to make like super boost power up or something so we don't do this which would be like a two layer uh, or like a three layer um inheritance like we don't do this we avoid that so if we want to make something like a super boost we will simply make that a new child of the base and then instead split the boosting up into some sort of function library or something that we can reuse uh, in case we want to reuse code in between power-ups like we will split that up into functions somewhere and uh, that you can call um, <clears throat> so we want to be careful with that. Additionally, we want to make sure that our power up, our base class, is kind of as small as we can possibly make it. So like, the only things that should be in there is either like pure virtuals, so like functions that don't do anything except to be overridden, something like you know, on power a power up activate or something like that, where the base version doesn't do anything. Like, it doesn't do anything on activated. It's meant to be overridden and purely overridden. Uh, so we want to avoid super calls, essentially. Uh, we don't want to have any super calls. Um, and for fo functionality in the power up base class, we want to keep that as small as possible. So we want to have as little functionality in the base class as we possibly can. Um, unless something is like super critical for a pickup to work at all. Um, we don't want to put it in the base class. Uh, so we have to be a bit careful there. Um, of course, that's just my opinion. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people like OOB, so then go ahead. I mean, I don't mind. But uh, this is my class, damn it. So we're not going to be doing OOP in my classes. Uh, so... Because, you know, uh, in, at Hayslight, you know, <coughs> people have the, if people have different opinions at Hayslight, you know, some people like OOP, some people don't, most people don't. Um, and, you know, the most buggy systems were the ones that had the most inheritance. Like the, the, um, the systems that were more, had deeper reliance on inheritance for functionality, those were the ones that always broke. And those were the ones that always needed fixing um and updates and uh, maintenance um of course that's just like you know uh what do you call it fuck what do, what do you call it when something is like only from personal experience like in court like if i bring up evidence in court that was only like a personal experience anecdotal yes that's just anecdotal uh, but, you know, I, I, I trust my gut on this. Um, but, yeah.
So this is the general shape I kind of want my uh, system to be. Like we have some power up base class and then we have in we uh, inherit from that to make each specific power up. But uh, that of course leaves a lot of to still up to implementation in Unreal. Do we make this pure CPP? Like with just classes or even structs if you want uh, in just pure C++. Or do we make it in some sort of unreal friendly way, in this case with perhaps U objects or even actors or something? So there's a few advantages and disadvantages to both of these. Um, it's kind of up to the system itself. So with pure C++, you would avoid Unreal Engine madness. So you don't have to worry about the garbage collector. You don't have to worry about all that goes into making a U object and how that works and what you can and can't do. Uh, it becomes much simpler. Just from the fact that you don't have all of this UE code in your system. Like you can kind of just make it however you want. Uh, if you don't make it stack allocated or heap allocated or whatever. You can kind of do whatever you want there. Uh, and you avoid a lot of code. And you can do whatever you want. So you can do, uh, so do whatever. Ever you. Like, you can take whatever tool from the C++ toolkit and just use that. So you don't have to worry about whether it will work or not. Since it's just pure C++, you can, you know, pull out everything. It's no stops. <coughs> of course, the, um, the upside with using something like U-Objects is even though we are avoiding the UE madness in pure C++, sometimes we do want it. So, garbage collector. Garbage collector. Of course, we might want to reference assets. Like we want to play a sound or uh, show a material or whatever we want to do. We want to reference assets, and that's just really annoying to do in pure C++, while in U object it's super easy. So referencing assets. Uh, what about using weak pointers to get around the garbage collection uh, problem? Yeah, that's what you would have to do, yeah. Something like that. But then, I mean, you have to set that system up yourself. Like, where are the share pointers? How do they live? How do they work? Like, you have to do that whole thing, which is not as easy as it sounds. Then you have to come up with sort of your own garbage collection to make it work. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a deep rabbit hole already. Yeah, it's it's not it's not trivial, while the garbage collector in Yobik is pretty trivial. So referencing assets is a big one. And of course, interfacing with... with LD, so level design, or art. Because, of course, if you make something in pure C++, you have no chance of actually bringing that into the Unreal Engine. Like, if you want to bring stuff into the Unreal Engine, it has to be written in an Unreal Engine way. So that means if you make stuff for C++ only, interfacing with level design and art, who mostly just work with blueprints and you know in the editor that's going to become really tricky to actually interface with them um so yeah we have some pros for both pure c++ and for u objects uh, i think this one is the biggest one in this case or these two actually in our case in our case, we're going to have like boost power-ups, missile power-ups, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things. It's going to spawn actors. It's going to spawn particle effects. It's going to play sounds. 
that's a lot of assets that we need to reference. So that's a big plus for you, Object already. And then stuff like interfacing with level design and art. These are probably going to be at least tweaked by level design, but also probably made by level design as well. Like the level design is probably going to be want to make a lot of these power ups. So that means that this point also really applies. So that's why in this case, um, I want to go with U objects. I, I choose for this system that we want to go with some sort of U object system so that we can reference assets and interface with level design and art very easily. We get that for free. Um, but of course, I'm thinking the downside of we have to, to go through the U, uh, Unreal Engine madness and it will be a little bit more complex. Uh, and we don't have every tool in the belt for C++ to help us out here. Um, so, boohoo. But you can of, of course also see that this could go the other way, right? You could see that this goes in the way of like if you're making some sort of very deep core system that you don't really need to be tweaked by level design. You don't need to reference any assets. Maybe it's just the most, maybe it mostly is like math calculation or something. Maybe you're doing some weird physics simulation or something, or you want to do some editor hacks or something, whatever. Then you might see that, okay, it's actually better to do this in pure C++ because um, I can make it simpler and I can do all of these tricks that I need to do. So then you will make it in pure C++. So it's definitely like a, you choose per system which one you want to use. It's not like, a, oh, you should always use U objects or oh, you should always do pure C++. It's issues. It's pros and cons. So we're going to go about setting this up in uh, with U objects then. Uh, let's do that after lunch because uh, we can't really do that much in five minutes. Uh, and I see you guys are yawning. So I'm guessing you guys want to take a break and have some lunch. Or you're really bored from my lecture. Mostly oh. bored. Yeah, mostly bored. Okay, all right, that's rude. Uh, yeah, but no, let's take, uh, let's take, um, let's take lunch. So I'll see you guys back 13 o'clock. Save the date. So have a nice lunch, guys. And uh, see you later. See you soon. See you later. Bye-bye.